This picture is in Kelvin Grove Art Galleries. The Druids bringing in the mistletoe. Painted in 1890, 131 years ago, by two of the Glasgow Boys, George Henry and Edward Atkinson Hornell. Yes, both these young artists had their brushes on this work, collaborating, forming the procession of figures, the hillside grove of trees, designing garments, adding symbols, no doubt arguing about what should go where. A clamshell insignia, George. Yes, here. A shimmering amulet, Eddie, to ward off evil in bright gold. Yes, big as a dinner plate. There'll be plenty of discussion between them because it is a strange subject. The Druids bringing in the mistletoe for a pair of urban lads from an industrial city to be painting. This vision of a pre-Christian ritual enacted in the still dawn of the primal forest and painted with the constant heaving rami of commercial Glasgow racketing by just outside the window of the boys' pokey wee Bath Street studio. So how did Henry and Harnell get their information on this ceremony? Where did they find out about the Druids and their elaborate rites for gathering the sacred mistletoe? Well, our Celtic ancestors did leave behind plenty of standing stones with ciphers and knotwork chiselled in the rock. Edward Harnell had tramped the windswept moors of Galloway, taking sketches of these and making rubbings. And finds had been dug up from time to time of stashed away hoards of intricately worked jewellery. Examples of this were on show in the British Museum. But what exactly all these snakings and cut marks and curly cues meant was far from clear. No writings of the Celts survived, no statement of their beliefs, no stories, no ballads, no songs. So we believe that Henry and Hernell must have consulted the earliest known mention of the Druids, which is in the works of Pliny, Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer operating just after the time of Jesus Christ. Now, Pliny was a great guy, intensely curious and determined to record basically everything that was known about the world of his time. Medicine, astronomy, geography, birds and animals, the customs of various countries. He wrote about them all. In fact, Pliny was so determined to investigate new stuff that one day he was looking out the window, this is AD 79, he's looking out the window and he sees Vesuvius erupting. It was just across the bay in Naples. And he thought to himself, a volcano spewing spates of lava and grim guffs of deadly ash. That's interesting. I better get a bit closer. So he hired a boat. And where did Pliny land in order to get this better look at the erupting volcano? Pompeii. Yeah. I'm afraid Pliny didn't get any elder after that. But by this time, he'd already recorded his take on the barbarian peoples of Europe's western fringe, the Druid priests of Galicia, Brittany, Wales and Scotland. And Pliny talks of fierce mystical figures in flowing robes gathering the mistletoe with a golden sickle at dawn on the fifth day of the moon and strewing the mistletoe across the horns of a pair of white curly bulls which are to be sacrificed. So, every detail of Pliny's account Henry and Hernell have faithfully recorded here. Of course they've added plenty of their own. The crimson pennant for instance and the dark twin faces, the tired little moon bobbling down behind the round plump hill, 
the low slanting sweeps of the early morning sun. And the faces of the druids. Henry and Hernell have chosen how the priests will look. Now, these could be read as the expressions of people in prayer. Solemn prayer. But is it just me? Or does this guy here also have a fair conceit of himself too? It's not unheard of in religious types. And there is an impassive quality in these pious masks. The hard trance glares of folks convinced it is right to sacrifice the bulls, valuable living creatures, in order to barter with their gods that by giving up these, they might be deserving of something even better sometime soon in the future. But they're severe, fixed and focused. Henry and Hanel leave us with a suspicion that all may not be wholly benign in this scene. Is there something wary in the eyes of the dark twins? Maybe the bulls are not the only ones in danger here. Tacitus, another Roman writer, he certainly accused the druids of some pretty ugly behaviour, including human sacrifice. And I've read around the subject of this painting as much as I can, but few scholars are prepared to stick their necks out and say exactly what the twins signify. I mean, maybe the guess where they're from, northern Spain, maybe? Your guess is as good as mine. And then, there's the gold. Metallic gold. Slapped on flat, with no shading, no sense of perspective. Thick gesso paint, buttered on with a palette knife, and scored into with a brad. It's not real gold leaf they used, but the effect is similar to the way halos were deployed in early Christian art. When the idea of gold is the most precious element, it meant that putting it round someone's head showed the immense spiritual worth of the subject. Now in 1890, nobody was handing out halos anymore. That had all been done away with, way back in the Renaissance, 400 years previously, when artists began painting Bible figures realistically, as human beings, a bit like you and me. Now these druids do not look like me, nor I trust you. So in harking back to medieval art, Henry and Hernell are nudging us to look at their work as if it was a discovered relic from a long forgotten age. I said that nobody was using gold like this, but that's not entirely true. Two years previously, Alexander Roche, another Glasgow boy, had put a golden halo around the head of good King Wenceslas. You know the guy, the bloke from the Christmas Carol, gathering winter few oo el. So, like many artists before and after, maybe Henry and Hernell saw what one of their pals was doing and thought, you know, that idea's got legs in it. He won't mind if we borrow it, will he? Just as other artists could well have seen the druids bringing in the mistletoe and been inspired themselves to take things further. Margaret MacDonald, for instance, 23 years old when the druids was first shown and at that time yet to settle on her one individual style. She could have been influenced by the druids to arrange her figures and formal groupings, to lavish them with luscious gold. It became a signature feature of her work, as did the flat tapestry-like designs of her gowns and cloaks. And of course, there's the Gustav Klimt connection. In the 1890s, he was still churning out rather stilted scenes of 
imaginary Greek theatre. And Henry and Hernell caused a huge stir when their painting was shown in Munich. Clint was in Vienna, a morning's train ride away. He could well have visited the exhibition or seen a reproduction in a magazine. The style we know him for certainly emerged suddenly as if out of nowhere. We do know that Clint met Margaret MacDonald when she showed in Vienna in 1900 with her husband, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. The closeness of Clint's work with Margaret's is striking and the flower bed pattern garments seem to have come from a similar inspiration. Just to uh, burst this rather intriguing bubble of thought a little though, Clint did come from a family of goldsmiths and may well have been finding his way towards what he wanted already without Margaret's or the Druids prompting. We cannot be sure at this distance who influenced whom. The open mouth gasps of hotly direct female sexuality, I think we can credit Klimt with making that breakthrough on his own. Or perhaps with a friend. So while many people in Glasgow are both fascinated and proud of this, one of the city's treasures, the Druids bringing the mistletoe has not always pleased everyone. In fact, when it was first shown, a London reviewer called it very startling and at the first sight, ridiculous. Another said it reminded him of a Persian carpet. And even now, the painting gets taken out on tour regularly, and it still gets stick from some critics. Laura Cummings in The Observer called it a concocted monstrous scene. Adrian Hamilton dismisses it as dramatic and perverse. It is not a likeable work. Too Wagnerian. He goes on to say, the trouble with the Glasgow boys is that they were more boys than they were Glaswegians. A few critics have pointed this out, that the Glasgow boys seldom rendered on canvas the actuality of the grim working city they came from. Fair point. But few painters of any nation did at the time. Manny with his Paris bar girls, certainly. Maybe Cezanne with his card players, Degas with his low-life absinthe jakies. But European art at the time was moving away from depicting life's realities and tripping blissfully towards the gorgeous. Monet and his lily pond nirvanas, Aubrey Beardsley's dark titillations, the curvaceous swirling tendrils of Art Nouveau, the Glasgow boys, many of whom depicted farm workers and cabbage patches, at least pause for a moment in this headlong rush into pure aesthetics. Charles Darwin scoffs, Henry and Hernell went all mystical and Celtic. The man must have a heart of stone who would not shriek with laughter at their jointly painted druids. But Henry and Hernell didn't stay mystical and Celtic for long. Maybe realising how much they were going to annoy shriekers like Charles Darwin 120 years later, they only did one other painting in this style, The Star in the East. Fascinating, but maybe not as strong. The Druids is a brief but rather marvellous detour in the careers of Henry and Hernell. An enjoyable amble down a tempting by road. They've pieced together this picture from, well, slightly flimsy scraps of knowledge, but truly powerful flights of fantasy. However, it is not, I would say, an outpouring of their own spiritual searchings. It is a fantasy of other people's beliefs. An imagined pageant of ancient customs. Theatrical. The boys had been working on murals together for the great exhibition in Glasgow only two years before. And I believe the Druids belongs more to that aspect of their art than does this. 
or this, or this, which are more typical of their output. Yes, having stirred up the art world with a radical subject matter and retro Byzantine, slightly camp style, Henry and Hernell soon returned to what concerned them most. Not what of the world to put into pictures, but far more important to them. How the world has changed when you set about the business of committing it to canvas. The Druids bringing in the mistletoe by George Henry and Edward Atkinson Hornell is a treasure of Glasgow.